So, uh, um, as it was said, my name is Alex Bergeron. I work at Periscope Data, um, where we are building a platform for data analysts to build dashboards by typing SQL. We are hiring, we are also not doing Scala, but if you are interested in working for a kind and positive group, uh, with a kind and positive group of engineers, come talk to me after the talk. All right, so first, I'm going, there's a lot of things that I'm not going to address during this talk because there's a lot of FX types and it's easy to get lost in some details. I'm not going to, you're not going to leave here knowing which library is the best because they all have different characteristics. So I'd rather focus on what are their differences. I'm not really going to talk about performance outside of both Cat's Effect and ZIO are pretty much neck to neck in terms of performance benchmarks. Actually, both communities tends to work with one another to make sure that uh, performance improvements in one libraries will be reflected in the other ones. I'm also not really going to talk about what people say on Twitter and how code of contracts makes people react. People tend to develop strong opinions about that and that wouldn't really make a great talk if I just focus on that. So I'm really going to focus on why there's so many different libraries and what is different between all of these different libraries. Um, and you might be wondering why would you use an effect type in the first place? You could just write println, just connect to a web server in a blocking way, uh, put results um, in the console and do everything in, in a single thread. Well, ultimately, if you're doing everything in a single thread, then everything will be blocking and slow, and you will end up not really having a lot of control over what is happening inside of your application and being able to represent that to different types makes it a lot easier to have a good understanding of what is happening when. And ultimately, you can just compose all of these types that you're building together to compose bigger programs from very small programs. Um, it allows to abstract over however you're running um, your, um, your different effects. You can write something and run it in Java in a given thread pool, and then run it in JavaScript in uh, an event loop uh, without possibility to block anything. And it's easy using these effects type to just write some functions that are not necessarily tail recursive, but um, exposes uh, an effect type outside of it, and then it will be evaluated on a trampoline so you'll be sure that it's not going to explode your stack. Um, first off, I just want to talk a little bit about futures because uh, some of you might be more familiar with futures and thinking, why should I use something that's like a future but lazy? Um, so typically when we're talking about futures, we are talking about a computation that is already running somewhere on the system and that its result, once it's computed, it will be memoized and from there, when you uh, assign a callback to a future, it's going either to be called as soon as the future, uh, the result is known, or immediately if the result is already known. These futures can definitely compose together um, using map and flat map. In, uh, so if you have a function that returns a future and another one that takes that result and returns another future, then you have a function from A to future of C, and it's pretty easy to compose these functions together. And it's when it came out in Scala, it was very powerful because it empowered people to easily write um, asynchronous, non-blocking, reactive applications, if you will, and it, it, in a way that was a lot easier to compose than through callbacks or um, other models. And ultimately, when you have a future, you can always block on it, but you have something that allows you to have an asynchronous computation running and you, you can ensure that you can act upon it asynchronously, so there's not really an interest of blocking unless you like wasting threads and making it hard to understand what's happening in your running application. Um, so there's two main implementations of futures that are known in Scala. There's a lot more than two, but most importantly, there's the one that is provided in the standard Scala library, which um, its main characteristic is that it's non-cancelable and it, that it's backed by uh, the Scala execution context, which typically is just a wrapper around a Java executor, so a typical Java thread pool. 
Twitter have their own implementations of scale of, of scale futures, which predates the scale implementation. Uh, its main characteristic is that it's backed by Finagle and that it's also cancelable. Um, personally, if you're, I would say that if you're interested in using futures and you're not really invested in the Twitter stack, uh, the Scala future might be easier to use just because it's just a lot more supported and the Twitter futures are really meant for what Twitter needed to do with futures. Not that they're bad, just that they're not as um, um, openly used in the larger community. Um, as I said, futures are not really an effect type. Be, uh, for some reasons, more importantly, um, a future is, al is already running, and when you try to compose a computations on these futures, uh, they will break. Refer referential transparency, by that I mean that if you have an effect that gets, let's say, a random number, or that might always yield a different result, and co build computations to, uh, together, you might not end up um, with the same result if you're using an actual effect type and evaluating that effect indep independently, you will al always get the same result if you're reading from the same future because at that point you'll be reading a value and not an effect. Uh, so ultimately futures will bundle, to bundle together a computation, a value, and error handling. And that makes it a pretty uh, powerful um, type for running effect but it's not really a good type to represent effect. The, ultimately, the fact that it means that you have an effect that is running also makes it a lot harder to optimize. Let's say that you have a future and then you map it, and then map it, and then map it. All of these invocations of map needs to um, create another future that then you have no idea whether it's running asynchronously or not, and then you need to run all of these futures on, in possibly different threads. If you're doing this on an effect type, uh, the libraries will be smart enough to realize that you can just uh, do a uh, function composition and uh, just take that um, effect, then run all of these three uh, maps in one other thread in a way that's a lot more efficient. So um, a quick note, a, a lot of you might have heard that uh, you're, when you're building use, using effects types, you should not evaluate your effects until the end of the world. Uh, the good, it might be confusing to, to some. Ultimately, what people say by the end of the world is as late as possible, but when it's necessary. Let's say that you're writing um, an, app, an application using the Play framework and you need to return the future to, to, uh, to the library. It's perfectly fine to evaluate your effect in a future at the end of your request. If you're able to build your entire application in FX, then it's perfectly fine to evaluate in the main loop of the application. Most of these libraries will actually provide you with a safe app tray that allows you to simply run a function that returns an effect and evaluate it in a safe way. Um, you ultimately should decide when you want to evaluate these effects. And in, in the way that is the most reasonable for your code base. We are all at different um, places in the uh, running everything in the same thread to not running anything until the main loop uh, spectrum. So feel free to do what seems right um, in your use case. Um, the first effect type that, that, I mean, the first real effect type that I'm aware of in, in Scala is the one that came from Scala Z uh, named IO. Um, it's literally a simple naive implementation of an IO monad. This is the, the only time I'm using that word in that talk, by the way. Um, the only thing it really does is that it wraps a computation in an IO type and then you, it will evaluate it synchronously at the very end. You can, that, that way it ensures that if you're doing the things that while uh, return our other IOs, then they will be evaluated through a trampoline in a safe way, and you can evaluate it in a safe app, as I've mentioned, but it's pretty minimalistic. There's no explicit support for asynchronous uh, workflows in that type. It's really meant for simple use cases, and ultimately, at least as far as I can tell, I've, I haven't seen much adoption of that type, um, but then 
scale as that came with the task abstraction, which is a little more complex. If you take a look at the code, it seems to be abstracting over some future of trouble and A, and here the future it refers to a scala Z future, which is something of a low level implementation that is compared to a, a usual future is meant to be lazy, and it, ultimately it's only there to implement uh, the scala Z7 tasks. And the fact that it uses something like that and also um, to represent asynchronous workflows. And that, that means that if you have a web server that's, or that's a library that is asynchronous but implemented in Java and it returns to you a callback, then you can bind it into that and get a task out of it. And then you can evaluate it. You can unsafe perform async and run it asynchronously, passing in a, a callback, which ensures that you're not blocking that you're not necessarily blocking the thread that you're using to call that. It's executed through something called a strategy, which when you take a look at the code, it's also an abstraction on top of, an ex of a Java executor service. Um, and all the, it was a, ver a, a lot more popular than, uh, at least from, from what I've seen, than the Scala Z IO. Of course, as in the past few years, um, as Cat's Effect and ZIO came out, the usage of Scala Z7 dropped uh, dramatically, and right now it's somewhat mostly used in more legacy code base, if you will. Um, more, um, uh, something that's a lot more modern um, is Cat's Effect IO, which recently it, um, it's version 1.0 of its library. Um, that, um, this, this is an effect type that is even more powerful, I'd say, than the other effects types, mostly because it supports um, also cancelable I.O. and that it's meant from the start to be running in whatever makes sense where you are running your Scala application. If you're running on Java, it's going to use um, an executor service in the background that is um, typically provided through, I think, just um, as of 1.0 or C2, because that's what my, I remember through a timer. Uh, I think there's... Uh, shift context um, in the latest version. I don't remember the exact name. But if you're running that on JavaScript, it's going to use set timeout to uh, bring this com these computations and run them when the event loop is freed. Um, it has a really great support from the type level community. Um, it's used in a lot of libraries you might have heard of, like FS2, um, HTTP4S, um, Duby. Um, uh, the one library I haven't mentioned is Monix, but Something that's of interest, Monix has its own task implementation, which predates Cat's <coughs> effect. But ultimately, the maintainer of Mo the main maintainer of Monix is one of the main contributors to Cat's effect. So these two types are effectively pretty equivalent. There are some slight differences in Monix tasks that makes it a lot of sense if you're using Monix, and if you're using Monix, by all means, use their tasks as much as possible. If not, probably Cat's Effect might be a better abstraction for you. And it's a really powerful library. It's, I've used it at my previous company, and it was really a joy to, to use. And it works really great, and I was pretty happy to use it. Um, but more recently, a new library came out called ZIO um, that, it is real, that came out with a really strong message of being very pure and representing all of your error types um, in a way that is encoded to the type. Something that's different is that it has two types parameters, which allows um, you to encode the fact that your I.O. will never fail. You can actually just throw an exception in there, and then it will just throw an exception, but you've made, you have kind of made it lie in a way. But you can also encode it clearly um, in the I.O. type the fact that there is a possibility that it might fail. You might even return, let's say, a string if you want to return an error message or your own error types. You can even encode the fact that it's an I.O. of nothing to say that it never, uh, cannot terminate. And um, of note, um, someone implemented uh, a cat's bio implementation, which takes this idea of having an I.O. type that is implemented through a bifunctor, but implements it purely on the cat's. 
um, cats, cats affect uh, type class stack. Um, but the, the main things that are of note of ZIO is that it has a really strong focus on purity and that um, at least when I was tr learning about ZIO, I couldn't see anywhere in the documentation a way to evaluate the IO effect outside of your main loop. This is actually files you just need to read a lot of the code base. Um, at this point, this project is not as mature as Cat's effect, and its documentation, while um, is a lot better than what it was for Scala Z7, it still need, it, you're still required to read the code base um, to really understand how things are happening. And I, but ultimately, if you really value purity and you believe that these, uh, this idea of having an error type represented at the type system, then feel free to, to, uh, to use that library. And at, at the end of the day, you'll end up with a program that will probably have some asynchronicity that will return um, just a callback. Sometimes it's going to return a scale of future because you're using a library. Sometimes it's going to return an effect type, could be cat's effect, could be ZIO, and it can become somewhat messy to have all of these types interacting with each other. The good news is that both cat's effect and ZIO have uh, functions to easily take a future, um, wrap it in an IO to defer its evaluation until required, and ultimately take its value and put it back into its effect type to lower the amount of uh, different types that you have to deal with in your system. And, <coughs> sorry, and it makes it, it makes it really easy to adopt these types in your system that's already using different types. And it's actually pretty powerful to be able to evolve your code base going from using futures everywhere to using um, uh, futures in your legacy code base and when a new code base that might be using cat's effect, let's, let's say, needs to interact with that part of the code base, then you can just wrap it there and have all of your effects in a way that executed in a way that's predictable. But that still leaves situations where you might end up implementing something without knowing what type you're going to use and for that, um, Cat's effect implemented a set of type classes um, that represent the different effects that you, um, you have. I, if, uh, there, um, and it's, these type classes are pretty, like, can represent cases where you have an effect that will be running synchronously or asynchronously, or you have effects that will be concurrent with each other and you might want to raise two different effects and get the first result. There's a lot of these different type classes. There's pretty solid documentation and it's really easy to use that and then get an IO type of the, out of that. Um, and also, um, ZIO provides its own type classes instance for that particular type. Um, there, it doesn't provide instances for every single um, type classes out there, um, but it still makes it easier to um, use another type. And even if you really want to use uh, a scale of seven uh, effect like IO or task. Um, there's a library called Shims which provides you with these uh, type, cl type classes instances to uh, be able to, let's say, run your more modern um, code base in a more older uh, effect type if you need that. That is all the, what I've had for you. I've just, I've, I'll just put it bigger, I've had a quick, I've had actually four different hello worlds that are implemented in Cat's Effect and uh, ZIO. The first one is simply a naive implementation using Cat's Effect. We have, a bit larger. sorry? A bit larger. Okay, let me just, all right, that should look good. Um, all right, the first one just naively wraps a string in an IO type and then flaps, flat maps into um, a, pr a print LN that is run asynchronously, lazily, and then we are running it by blocking it. Same thing for ZIO. Um, here we are guaranteed to never crash, but it's basically the same 
uh, implementation where I get a pure hello world and run it synchronously through ZIO. Um, I'm calling it through a function called on safe run, which I can get because I'm extending the RTS, which is based on my understanding what uh, ZIO uses as its runtime environment. And usually, if you want to execute IOs outside of main, this is how you should. This is the only way I, can, I figured out how to do it with ZIO. Um, and here I have a very abstract, let's say, let's call it like that, implementation of an LO world that uses any, anything that just provides me with a sync type class. And from there, I, I just, um, as usual, just wrap that value in a pure, um, uh, in a pure instance of that, and then flat map over it and represent uh, and delay the evaluation of printland. And from there, I'm able to get an equivalent um, implementation for cat's effect and get an equivalent for tasks, which is something that ZIO provides to um, ensure that it's two parameters fits into a type class that expects one parameter. Um, and ultimately, I'm just uh, running it unsafely. And if I call it to the command line, well, there's some warnings, but it prints, LO, it prints different versions of LO worlds. <laughs> That's all I had for you. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, do you have any questions? Like I'm kind of biased because I've impl I've added Cat's Effect at my previous company, and it's the one I feel the most familiar building systems quickly. Um, I do insist that my goal of the talk is not to li leave anyone with a feeling that I think anyone is any one of these libraries are best. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Great. Thanks so much, Alex. Really appreciate the talk. It was wonderful. Uh, I guess it's important.